Hi everyone, and thanks for having me here today. Um, I'm here to talk about CSS Grid or the CSS Grid Layout Specification to give it its full title. So if you haven't heard of CSS Grid before, it's the first specification that we've had that's actually really designed for giving you full control over the layout of your web pages. And it's kind of unbelievable that up until just a few years ago when CSS Grid was first conceived, we didn't really have a proper way of doing this. We kind of hacked around for years with, first of all, tables and floats and then flexbox. But we never had anything that was really designed before for two-dimensional layouts. But now we do. And I want to introduce you in this talk to some of the main concepts and properties of CSS Grid that you can start using today um, to build complex, responsive layouts. So Jen Simmons is one of the key people uh, responsible for getting grid layout to where it is today. And she coined the term intrinsic web design to describe the next evolutionary stage of web design, so beyond responsive design. So while we might be familiar with some responsive design patterns where as your viewport, get, viewport gets smaller, elements start stacking on top of each other, with intrin intrinsic web design, it's more of a fluid approach than that. So you might have a mixture of fixed and fluid columns. Um, elements might expand and collapse at different rates. So it's a more fluid approach even than responsive design. And I think requires a whole new era of web design thinking to really take advantage of that. And I think we're, we're still right at the beginning of that at the moment. So in this talk, I hope to demonstrate some of the power and flexibility that GRID gives us to build these more flexible layouts. So I'm a front-end developer at Ordu, um, a mobile ordering startup in Bristol. Um, and I'm also a Mozilla tech speaker. And that means I've had some speaker training for, from Mozilla. And they support me to come and attend and speak at events. Um, I don't get paid by Mozilla. So all the times I mention the Firefox Grid Inspector, which is brilliant, <laughs> um, I'm not actually getting paid for that. They're not <laughs> it's not advertising or anything. Um, but as an aside, uh, Mozilla have really invested in CSS debugging tools um, recently. Um, so they have a really, really great grid inspector, Flexbox inspector. If you're working with CSS layout at all, I thoroughly recommend using Firefox um, for debugging your, your grids. So why would we just not just use Flexbox? People ask me this question all the time because in a lot of situations, Flexbox seems to serve us pretty well. Um, a lot of existing grid systems like Bootstrap and others um, use Flexbox under the hood. But Flexbox was never really designed for building a grid layout system. So that's not to say that we don't need Flexbox. Flexbox is great at what it does. And Rachel Andrews spoke recently at an event apart, and she summed up Flexbox's advantages pretty well. So she said, Flexbox is great for taking a bunch of oddly sized things and returning the most reasonable layout for those things. <coughs> so she also said that when you start putting widths on everything, you're kind of working against Flexbox. And that's what a lot of these grid systems do. So Flexbox is designed to be flexible. We still need it. I still use it all the time. But it's not a grid layout system. So Grid is the first specification that's designed for 2D layout. So it allows us complete control over placement of items on the row and the column axis. So it allows us to build more complex layouts than with previous layout methods, which would have needed JavaScript or at least a lot of extra hacky code. Now, I want to run through some of the terminology I'll be using in this talk. The grid is the container onto which you place your items, and it can look something like this. It consists of one HTML element with the display property set as grid. And the direct children of that element are the items that can be placed on your grid. Grid tracks are your rows and columns, and they're described by the grid template columns and grid template rows properties. <coughs> 
Grid cells are the places where a row and column track intersect, so they're the smallest possible units onto which you can place a grid item. And a group of more than one grid cell in a rectangular layout is a grid area. So you might potentially want to, span, to place an, a grid item spanning multiple cells, and that would create a grid area. Gaps between tracks are commonly referred to as gutters, and they're defined by the column gap and row gap properties, uh, which were formerly grid row gap and grid column gap. Um, so you might still see that syntax used quite a bit. And the reason they were changed um, to, omit, to omit the grid row gap and grid column gap uh, part is because in the long term, uh, these properties are hopefully going to be um, used in other layout methods like flexbox and multi-column layout too. So it's kind of future proofing in that way. So let's define our first grid. We have one element which we're going to give a class of grid and we're going to set the display property as grid. Now we can use grid template columns and grid, grid template rows to define a four by four grid where each column is 200 pixels wide and each row is 150 pixels high. Um, just a quick note about my slides here. So in the bottom uh, right hand corner of some of these slides, I've included a link to the relevant CodePen demo. Um, I will share my slides um, at the end of the talk, so you don't need to worry about writing those down. But if you're interested in exploring some of these um, ideas further, then um, I'll be able to give you a reference. Now we can use column gap and row gap to set a 20 pixel gutter in between each of our tracks. So now we have our grid, but it's not responsive yet because we're using fixed track sizing. And if we jump back to our code for a moment, you can see there's quite a lot of repetition here in our grid template columns and grid template rows properties. Now, we can make that code a bit more concise. And the first way we can do that is by using the repeat function. And the repeat function takes two arguments, the number of tracks and the size of those tracks. So we have four tracks on the column axis at 200 pixels and four tracks on the row axis at 150 pixels. We could also use the shorthand grid template for grid template rows and grid template columns. Um, this is fine here because we have quite a simple grid. Um, I prefer not to use shorthand um, too often, especially because we'll see a little bit later, some of our grid template columns and grid template rows declarations can get quite long and adding shorthand into the mix as well can make them a bit less readable, but that's just a matter of personal preference. And we can use gap as the shorthand for row gap and column gap. And because it's the same in both directions here, we just need the one value. Now, with grid, you can use any sizing unit that you normally would to size an element. So you can use pixels, and rams, percentages. But unlike anything else, with grid, you can use the FR unit. And this is what we can use to make our grid responsive, or at least flexible. So FR unit is a new unit exclusive to grid. Um, it's short for fraction unit. So FR units are flexible units. And tracks sized with the FR unit take up a pro proportion of space in the grid container. So they respond to leftover space the way that flex items fill space in a flex container. And they're one of the most useful units in grid. It means there's very little need for calc or percentage sizing. And a lot of the places you'd normally use percentages, you probably want to consider using FR instead. So FR takes all your gutters and fixed tracks into account and distributes the remaining space accordingly. So if we want four equal width column tracks, we can use the repeat function um, to say we want four columns, each of those one FR unit. So that will give us four equal width tracks. Now, if we wanted one column to be twice the width of the others, we could make that one two FR units and the others one, one FR unit. So that's, we don't need to do any maths there. That's taking into account all of our gutters and everything else. You can mix fixed and fluid tracks. So we could have three columns at 200 pixels each, and the last column could be one FR unit. And that means that last column would take up the, re the rest of the space in the grid after those 
three tracks had been accounted for. So FR units are actually resolved last. The grid calculates all your fixed tracks and length-based tracks and your gutters and then distributes the space for the FR units. And that can be quite helpful to remember sometimes. Another concept that's quite important to understand in grid is implicit and explicit tracks. Now, so far, we've defined the explicit grid. Our grid will definitely have four columns and four rows. Now, if you place an element outside of the explicit grid's boundary, then implicit tracks will be created. And why might this be useful? So, sometimes you don't know the number of items you need to place in your grid, so you don't know how many tracks your grid needs. And an example of that might be a news feed or an image gallery, where you have dynamic content. You might have you know, content constantly generated. You might have 12 items in a grid, or you might have 20 items in a grid. You just don't know. So you need new rows to be created to, for, for your grid when there is content to fill those rows. Now, instead of using grid template rows, if, assuming that we do want to lay these out on the row axis, which is probably the most com common, we can use grid auto rows. And that's going to control the height of your implicit tracks. So any newly created rows will have a fixed height of 150 pixels if we specify it in the grid auto rows property here. Now, the default is auto, so that might be suitable for something like a news feed. But perhaps if you want, say, an image gallery, you might want to give a fixed height to those tracks. So by using grid auto rows instead of grid template rows, rows for your grid will only be created when there's content to fill them. If there's no content in your grid, then our grid will collapse down to a height of zero in this case. And you can use grid, or, grid auto rows in addition to grid template rows. So here, this will give us four explicit rows at 150 pixels each using grid template rows. And those will always exist regardless of the content. Plus, any extra rows that are created will also have a height of 150 pixels. So now we have our grid, but it's currently invisible as it hasn't got any content. And in some cases, this is desirable, like the image gallery or newsfeed examples that I mentioned. You don't want to have to manually place every single grid item. But let's imagine a different case where we have a, a bit more of a complex component to build. So we want to build a two-dimensional component like this. We have an image on the left, a large heading that's centered within our component, both horizontally and vertically, and a text block on the right. And now we're going to place these items by grid line. Now, grid lines are numerical lines that sit between each track of your grid and we can reference those line numbers when placing items. So this component needs three rows, so we're going to change our grid template rows property a bit. But otherwise, the code is the same. We have four column tracks, each of those one FR unit. So we just need to adjust the grid template rows property. So the top and bottom row are going to be one FR, uh, because that will mean our heading can be centered in the middle uh, vertically and our heading row is going to have a height of auto. And that means that our, our heading can be longer or shorter. If perhaps we have a really long heading and it wraps onto two lines, then that grid row will respond accordingly and the heading will still be centered. We also are going to maintain a, a space between the heading and the text block um, because we have a, we're using the gap property for the gutter. So, with grids, you can have elements that respond to each other and be context aware. Um, you can, <laughs> uh, they can, it's not like using absolute positioning, where if we place our heading and text block over this grid, then you know, those aren't going to respond to each other. You might get the text crashing into your heading, for example. Um, grid, in grids, our elements are context aware. Now we can place an item, in this case our image, from a start line to an end line using the grid column start and grid column end properties. And the same um, on the row axis with grid row start and grid row end. 
And we can do the same with the heading and the text block. Now, we actually don't need an end line for the text block um, and for the row axis of our grid heading because by default, items will span one grid track. So we can do away with a bit of code there if we only want that item to span one track. So now we have our grid, but again, that's quite a lot of code to write. So let's shorten <coughs> that a bit. We can use grid column as the shorthand for grid column start and grid column end. And grid row is the shorthand for grid row start and grid row end. So there are a number of different ways to place items. But one thing we could do is use the span keyword instead of a start or end line. So using the span keyword, instead of the line you want your item to start or end, it tells your grid how many tracks that item should span. So in, in some cases, that might, might be more sensible than using a line number especially if you have a very large grid. You might know that you want this item to always span a fixed number of tracks. So let's run through some of the different options that we know so far for placing a grid item. You can have a start line and an end line. You could have a start line and span. You could have span and an end line. And sometimes it's useful to be able to place an item by end line, especially if you have a very large grid. Like if you know that you have an item that you want to place one line away from the end, you have to do a little bit of mental maths to work out how many lines from the start that's going to be. So placing items by end line can be simpler. And these are all different ways to place our image in exactly the same place on our grid. Now, I just want to jump in and talk about in implicit tracks a little bit more because this is something that I see people struggle with in grid quite a lot. Now, if we place this item at starting at grid line three with a span of three, it would generate implicit tracks on the column axis as there aren't enough columns available in our grid. So that would do this. Basically, you can see right at, right at the far end on the right of the grid, um, there are two extra gutter widths being created. And that's because we're actually creating two more tracks for, for our grid. Those are implicit tracks but because they have a default width of auto, they've collapsed right down to zero. But we have still created those two extra gutters. So this is kind of gonna throw our layout off a little bit. And if we set the grid auto columns property to 100, we can see those extra columns that we've created. So this behavior is really useful in grid, but it's also something that causes a lot of headaches for people, as I've seen. And one thing you can do is in inspect this in Firefox. And if you check what your line numbers are in your grid, you'll see whether you've cr accidentally created extra tracks or not. So if you are having problems with grid, that's a really good port of call. Now, another way we can place grid items is by naming grid lines. So here I'm naming lines for the heading, start line, and end line on the column axis, and the same on the row axis. Now, you can use any name for your grid lines, but if you suffix those with a start with start and end, you get a grid area. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm naming two lines on the row axis and two lines on the column axis. And now I can just place that heading by referencing the grid area. So we could name lines for all of our grid items. And in some cases that might be a good idea, but in other cases this could just be a bit confusing. Um, and a bit more error prone. So there's one other property that I want to introduce as a possible option for placing items on your grid. And that's the grid template areas property. And grid template areas basically lets you draw your grid with text. So here I'm using I for image, T for text block, and a full stop to denote an empty cell. Now you can use any name for your grid areas. You can use uh, a full word, you can use just a letter, or you can even use emoji. But you can't use, I, I have seen people use this, <laughs> um, but you can't use numbers. Um, and areas must be rectangular. You can't you know, try and do something clever here, like make a T-shaped area or an L-shaped area. That just won't work. It will have no effect. So now we can just reference that grid area again to place the item. Now, because you can't have overlapping cells using grid template areas, we still need to place our grid heading. Um, so I'm going to do this by using line numbers here. But you might notice 
For the grid heading, I'm also using a, a negative line number. And negative grid lines are basically your grid flipped around. So line one will also be line minus five in this case, because we have five grid lines. And line five at the far end of our grid will also be line minus one, and so on. And I find ne using negative lines really useful. Again, especially if, if you have a large grid. I was working with a uh, 26 column grid a little while ago, and I needed to center the headings like this. Um, but it had to be like, five lines away from the start and five lines away from the end. Now, I don't, if I want to change that at some point, I don't want to then have to work out, okay, what's you know, five lines away from uh, 26 every time, or you know, seven lines away from 26. I can just rem you know, say, right, I'm placing it you know, five lines away from the start, and therefore I know that it also needs to be minus five as the end line. And that can be really, really helpful. Now, we can also use alignment properties with grid, um, just like we can with Flexbox. And here I'm using align self on the text block to align it to the top of our component. But let's say we have another variant of our component where we want to align the text block to the bottom. So we could use flex end for this, and it would always align to the bottom of our component. Now, there's just one more grid property that I want to share with you um, that is really useful in creating responsive layouts. And that's the min max function. So this is a way of sizing your tracks. And it takes a minimum size and a maximum size, as the name suggests. So at the moment, we're using <coughs> an FR unit to size all of our column tracks, which means as we shrink our, as we shrink our viewport down, those, collapse will, those columns will all collapse at the same rate. They'll all get narrower and narrower. Um, so our layout doesn't look too great when we get to smaller sizes. But using grid's min-max function can help us here. So this is an example of min-max in action. The, all the centre columns have a minimum of zero and a maximum of 60 pixels, and the two outer columns have a minimum of 20 pixels and a maximum of one FR. So as, we shrink, as our viewport shrinks, you'll see the outer columns collapse first, down to a minimum of, of 20 pixels, and then, and only then, the inner columns start to collapse. And this is a pattern that I use quite often here. Like when I want to um, have content aligned to a max width wrapper, which would be the center columns, but also have items occasionally break out and align to the edge of the viewport. And you can do that with this grid pattern. You can place items all on that grid and have them align to different parts of the grid. So now we can use minmax in our grid template columns property with li this layout. Um, I won't go into exactly what's happening here because there's obviously a lot of um, min-maxes in here. Um, but this is what happens now if we shrink that down. You can see the outer columns and the, the column in between the image and the heading, uh, the image and the text block um, collapse down first, while the width of the text block is still maintained up until we get down to quite small sizes. So you probably still want to use a media query when we get down to like mobile size, but actually now this layout is pretty robust, even down to maybe sort of tablet size. We don't need to use as many media queries. So we've covered quite a lot here, and you won't have cause to use all of these properties every time you use Grid, but I hope it gives you some idea of what Grid, cap grid is capable of, and some of the different options available to you when approaching complex layouts. So here are some resources if you'd like to learn more about CSS Grid. I really recommend anything by Jen Simmons and Rachel Andrew. So Rachel Andrew has grid, gridbyexample.com, which is a really great resource of uh, different examples and articles about Grid. And Jen Simmons has the Layoutland YouTube channel. Uh, the very last one is my own blog, CSS in Real Life, where um, I've written quite a lot about some of the different concepts I've gone through today. So thank you for listening, everybody. Please do come and find me if you have any questions about grade later on.